social media is ablaze showcasing the embarrassing screenshots of Adam Levine as adultery and its definition are being discussed at length. But we want to take a look at how sexual atheism has also entered into the church and why God put so much weight into the fidelity of our marriage covenants. Stay with us as we look at these and other stories on the 511 News. Welcome back to the 511 News. I'm your host, Chad Davidson of Good Fight Ministries. And on today's episode, we're going to be looking at a number of statistics as well as a number of stories that have to do with the idea of adultery and what the Bible says about it and why we really need to do a better job in the church of discussing how adultery comes, how it takes place, and really how we can help our brothers and sisters safeguard themselves from stepping into another person's marriage bed. And this all comes on the heels of some recent screenshots that have been posted and some TikTok videos that have been done regarding Maroon 5 frontman Adam Levine. And sadly enough, this is all taking place while his wife is pregnant as multiple women as young as 20 years old have posted about some of the cringy, I guess you could say, alluring text or DMs that he has sent to women regarding how they look and so forth, even though he himself is married. And this comes on the heels of the recent slap heard round of the world when Will Smith slapped comedian Chris Rock after he made a joke about his wife. His wife, Jada Pinkett Smith, who actually used her own husband, Will Smith, on her talk show to talk about her adultery affair with a rapper by the name of Future. But, sadly enough, when the topic was brought up concerning adultery, which is the sin of adultery that comes right from Scripture, she did not want to call it that. In fact, she wanted to call it an entanglement when Will Smith brought this up to her. And sadly, the younger man who she committed the adulterous relationship with was actually her young son's friend. And he, after hearing her entanglement talk regarding what they were doing one with another, wrote a song where he talked about the tangling that took place in the bedroom. And sadly enough, when you look at a man sitting there across from his wife talk about her adulterous affair and then lightening the load while just calling it an entanglement, not only am I sad for him, and I'm sure that he has plenty of his own sins that are going on there that allots for this to take place, and it's always good to have forgiveness when adultery has taken place, but nonetheless, when we look at this, you see the despair of a man across sitting across from her while listening to her talk about this and once again using vernacular that would make it not seem as bad and this is something that is quite common with plenty of sins when it comes to so many of the sins that people commit they always have another word to call it right it's an affair rather than an adult adulterous relationship right oh it's a mistake rather than a sin against god This is common when people are sharing the gospel, sadly enough. This is common from the pulpit, where people will take words where the Bible actually talks about sin in how gross and how horrible it is, and will just lighten the load and say, well, we all make mistakes. No, you're breaking God's laws. These are serious things we need to talk about. And all of this lightening of the load when it comes to adultery does nothing when it comes to our reflection, as we are supposed to be unstained towards the outside world, so that when we they look at us, when they look at believers, that we would be able to call out sin and not be hypocrites, because we ourselves are walking in them. I believe that Romans chapter 2, while addressing the Jews in, in terms of having the law and so forth, but talks about those who would say, do not steal, yet they themselves steal. They say, do not lie, yet they themselves are liars. And this is really, really important. Plenty of people want to talk about how Jesus came against organized religion. And really, the fact is, is when you see Jesus hating something more so than an organized religion, 
It's that he was hating the hypocrisy. He was hating those who were shutting out the kingdom of God to some people, and they themselves would not enter as well. He was hating on the whitewashed tombs, those two-faced people that simply come to him with his lips, but their hearts were far from him. And when it comes to infidelity, of course we are expecting to see this from the outside world, but it's not supposed to be named among the brethren. It is not supposed to be something that is commonplace in the fellowship of God. It is not something that should be happening on a regular basis. That doesn't mean that people don't stumble in many ways. That doesn't mean that stumbling blocks are now therefore avoidable, but they are unavoidable in terms of what Jesus said in Luke 17, that people will stumble. But what it does mean is that we are more than conquerors through him who loves us, that we rely wholly and completely on the Holy Spirit and on Jesus Christ, his finished work on the cross, and we say, we shall not fall under this. We shall not go into the brothel. We shall not walk the way of the adulterous man or adulterous woman and fall into their arms. We do. We want to stay clear of this stuff. We want to be so far away from it, we flee from it. And I think about this in what most people would say is Paul's first letter uh, out of his epistles. And this comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And plenty of people, and we've talked about this a number of times on the show, ask, I wonder what God's will is for my life. What is God's will for my life? Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 actually tells us what God's will is for our life. Finally then, brothers and sisters, we request and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received instruction from us as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel even more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. I want to point this out because the first thing he talks about here to these believers in Thessalonica, a, a pagan area, the first thing he is telling them here is specifically, hey, we are not like the Gentiles. So when we see these things going on in the world, whether it's the Boston Celtics coach who is about to get suspended because of some sort of consensual relationship, and then when you look on Twitter and so forth, like how could they be suspending him if it was consensual, whatever it may be, Sadly enough, even believers will minimize that because they want their favorite basketball team to win a few games. And it is very, very sad to see this. But most importantly, we need to look at the church first and say, wait a second, are we being a reflection to the outside world of what true companionship, of what true covenantal marriages should look like according to the scriptures so that the outside world, when they peek in and look at the Christian church, that they would see a reflection that is of Jesus and not the world, that they would not see a mirror, but that they would look at and see something entirely different, that marriage, the marriage bed is kept undefiled, that marriage is esteemed amongst us, as it says in Hebrews chapter 13, that we should look at this and make sure that when the outside world looks at us, they are continually seeing as husbands and wives people that are in a covenant, loving relationship, that the two passionately love one another, that we would be a good example. And this is a very big, I, I guess it's a big stick with me that I, I want to make sure that my marriage is a marriage that the outside world would also want to say, why do you have this marriage? Where does this love come from? Where does this joy come from? And for those who are single, where does this covenant you have with God completely, just you two together, maybe the gift of singleness if you have that, or you preparing yourself for your bride or preparing yourself for the groom you will one day have, all of these things are attitudes that we are to have walking in the will of God under the sanctification as we grow over and over again, more and more like Jesus as the day draws near, as we see the world getting more wicked, that we would be much better than what the Gentiles are doing. But sadly enough, when I look at the statistics, when I look at 
some of the dating reports reporting that's been done on some of the online dating websites regarding specifically what it looks like for Christians and what their views are regarding sex before marriage and moving in. I want to read from some of these statistics. And some of these are a little older, but it was the most up-to-date that I could find. And it is a mixture too. So this is not all believers, but it's over 2,000 different people between JDate and ChristianMingle.com being quizzed on different dating things from as simple as what is a first date or what does it look like, how old you should be, what whatever, all of those. But the ones that stuck out to me on these graphs have to do with moving in one with another and also sex before marriage. Because I want to read some of these stats to you, and they are staggering. This is a mixture of JDate, which is a Jewish dating website, and Christian Mingle. And here are the statistics. 92% of men said that they would have sex before being married. 81% of women say they would have sex before marriage. 93% of men say they would move in before marriage. And 82% of women say they would move in before marriage. And this is heartbreaking, specifically if you just go not only what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, that the man shall leave his mother and father and be cleaved together, and that's supposed to be the union there. But when you look at it over and over again, you see just the detrimental display that our society has had because specifically when it comes to having sex recreationally. And the fact that sexual atheism has come into the church this way, and you can say, oh, well, there's some J-date. Guys, it's 92% we're talking here. This is not a small percent of people that say it's totally fine. Guys, Hebrews chapter 13 is really clear. If marriage is not held in high esteem, then guess what's going to happen? They're, we're not going to be recognizing and warning that fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Fornicators and adulterers, God will will judge. That is a very serious, serious thing. When we look at sexual sin in the Bible and the warnings, the warnings are found in Revelation 21, 8 in regards to those who go to the lake of fire that burns forever. We look at it over and over again. When you see warnings, sexual behavior is right at the top of the list. And I think about this in light of Proverbs, in light of also understanding why God puts such a weight on this. I want to read from Proverbs, and I want to look at some of these warnings and and check these out because they are so important. And, And in this day and age, I want you to think about this. And maybe you're someone, if you're married, you're thinking about committing adultery, let this be right now. You say, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to walk down that path. Let something right now shake you to say, I will not do that. I will not do it. It's not going to happen. I'm going to flee. I'm having this temptation. There's someone maybe at my work or my child's school or whatever it may be, and I'm going to step into it. Don't. I'm telling you, don't do it. It's not worth it. And I want to read from Proverbs because you think about who is writing this, right? We have Solomon writing. And Solomon, if there is anybody that knows about the perils of adultery, about the perils of not staying with the wife of his youth, it is probably Solomon Let's, let's look at these words that he is talking to his son. Listen to these words. In Proverbs chapter 2, starting in verse 16, it says, To deliver you from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flatters with her words, that leaves the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death, and her tracks lead to the death. None who go to her return again, nor do they reach the paths of life. So you will walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be uprooted from it. In that context, Solomon is talking about wisdom and making sure that it is worn like a wreath, making sure that it's kept on our hearts, that we don't get away from wisdom, that we would seek it out in the first couple of verses, four and five specifically, as we would find treasure, precious silver, that we would go after wisdom that way and not be taken about by the adulteress. In chapter five, starting in verse one, my son, give attention to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding, that you may observe discretion and your lips may reserve knowledge for the lips of an adulteress drip honey and smoother than oil 
is her speech. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Guys, just pointing it out, think about that right now. So often, I guess, online and, and, and so forth, so many of this drip of honey, this, this, this lie that, oh, it's going to be sweet to the taste, whatever it may be, but yet it's bitter as goal. I've heard uh, pornography and, and masturbation actually described as something that over and over again promises with anticipation but never gives you satisfaction. And that is the same here, whether infidelity or otherwise. It promises. It promises something that it never gives. And if you had to pay up front what was due for the sin that you're about to commit, I don't think you'd pay it. If you had to pay before getting the food, right? A lot of people do that, right? You have to pay before you get the food rather than wait until the bill comes. If the bill comes first, I think a lot of people would realize, wait a second, I don't want to commit this and realize exactly what I'm going to do. The crumbling of families, the crumbling of relationships, the ruining of people, the hurt of children, all of these things. Recognize it and see it as wormwood. See it as bitter as gall. See it for what it is. Verse 5, her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable. She does not know it. Now then, my sons, listen to me and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. Guys, this is something so important for us to recognize. Maybe it's on Instagram and you keep scrolling up and down and there are a bunch of pictures that are scantily clad that you're looking at. Or maybe it's at work and you keep going by someone's office and having a conversation with them over and over again private, privately about things you probably shouldn't be talking about. Remember the words here. Do not go near the door of her house. Don't even think about it. Verse 9, Or you will give your vigor to others and your years to the cruel one, and strangers will be filled with your strength, and your hard-earned goods will go to the house of an alien. Think about how divorce court, and think about how many men work every day in order to now pay alimony or pay for their children while they're estranged from them. Think about how that works exactly as Solomon warned here, exactly what he was saying. Verse 11, and you groan at your final end when your flesh and your body are consumed and you say, how I have hated instruction and my heart spurned reproof. I have not listened to the voice of my teachers nor inclined my ear to my instructors. I was almost in utter ruin in the midst of the assembly and congregation. Drink water from your own cistern and fresh water from your own well. Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be yours alone and not for strangers with you. You know, there are plenty of people today, it's very common for people to now be swingers. I mean, it's been common for a number of years, and sadly enough, I've had family members that I love dearly that fell into that same exact sin, and it is heartbreaking. Imagine, I could not imagine that. I won't imagine that, seeing somebody else take my wife as a lover. It's absolutely disgusting. And the fact that anyone would allow that and be okay with that is, is heartbreaking. And God is saying, you should not disperse abroad the streams of water. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. I think this is really important, and it's something that I've seen missed even in Christian counseling and talking with brothers and sisters in Christ is loving and adoring and anticipating being with your bride, being with your bridegroom, desiring them passionately. This is something that we as husbands and women as wives should be desiring their husbands passionately. It's not something to put on the side and, yeah, we'll do that when we have time. No, you should be desiring one another to be with one another. It is very, very important. And, and there's an entire book, Song of Solomon, of desiring to be with one another. And we should take note of that. For why should you, my son, be exhilarated with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? I think that's interesting, the exhilarated by, with an adulteress, because so much of the act of adultery has to do with them getting away with something, being sneaky. 
that they find an exhilaration. And, and so much of this, for so many of the men and the women who get involved with this, this sneaky sneaking around and cheating on that exhilarating anticipation is what gets them involved in this in the first place and gets them excited. But sadly enough, like it is with the conscience, as you sear it over and over again, this is why you have things called fetish porn, because people never get enough. This darkness, this sickness, this disgusting sin is never enough to fill the disgusting appetite of those who can't help themselves and are not satisfied with what the Lord has given them. And it's heartbreaking. For the ways of the man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all his paths. Guys, that should be scary enough to know that God is watching you when you commit these acts, whether it's with pornography or adultery, literally with someone else. His own iniquities will capture the wicked, and he will be held with the cords of his sin. So many people think that they're free to do these sins, but really they're in chains of bondage, as Peter wrote, wrote about in 2 Peter, the first chapter. In Proverbs chapter 6, starting at verse 20, it says, My son, observe the commandment of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk to you. Guys, that is so important for us to tie these things to our heart, recognizing that these things will keep us from the path of evil. How will a young man keep his way pure? According to Psalm 119, according to God himself, by guiding it according to your word. Hide his word in your heart that you don't sin against him. These things are important. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is a light and reproofs for discipline are the way of life to keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty in your heart nor let her capture you with her eyelids. For an account of a harlot one is reduced to a loaf of bread and an adulteress hunts for the precious life. Can a man take fire in the bosom and his clothes not be burned? Woo, no, he can't. Or can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is the one who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. And I want to get to Proverbs 7 here. Because starting at verse 6, we get a real picture here, and it's really interesting because if we, I guess if we move this over to our modern time, this woman might even be a churchgoer, sadly enough. You'll see what I mean. For at the window of my house, I looked out through the lattice, and I saw among the naive and discerned among the youths a young man lacking sense, passing through the street near her corner, and he takes the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, and in the darkness. And behold, a woman comes to meet him dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. She is boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She is now in the streets, now in the squares, and lurks by every corner. So she seizes him and kisses him. And with a brazen face, she says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings. Today I have paid my vows. Therefore, I have come out to meet you to seek your presence earnestly, and I have found you. I've spread my couch with coverings and with covered linens of Egypt. I've sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us drink our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with caresses. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him. At the full moon, he will come home. With her many persuasions, she entices him. With her flattering lips, she seduces him. Suddenly he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool until an arrow pierces through his liver as a bird hastens to the snare so he does not know what it will cost him, his life. Guys, pay attention to these words. So many of them, it's pretty incredible to see this. Oh, my husband is away. He won't be back for a very long time. How many husbands have come home catching their wife in infidelity and the amount, of, the amount of, of anger that would rage? And I find it very interesting that so many in ecumenical movements and, and in New Age thought think that the jealousy of a husband may be a bad thing or the jealousy of God, most Im importantly, they think is a, a bad thing. In fact, Oprah Winfrey, she specifically mentioned that it was when she heard God is a jealous God in the Ten Commandments that she had a real problem with that. But when we look at it, are you really a good husband? Do you really love your wife if you aren't jealous as someone comes to be her lover? Do you really love her? 
Do you really care about her? No, you don't. And in fact, God being a jealous God shows me that he actually cares about us. And I think in Genesis chapter 32, this is the place that we see the best picture of this. Because God has now not only taken them out of the land of Egypt, performed many miracles for them, but now says, I want to have a covenant with you. And in fact, they agree and they are making a covenant with God. They are going to be in covenant relationship with him. So basically now they are married to God. And yet guess what happens on the honeymoon? Moses goes away and here's what it says in Genesis, the 32nd chapter. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come from the mountain, the people assembled around Aaron and said to him, come, make us a God who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. Aaron said to them, tear off the gold rings, which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people tore off all the gold rings, which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then he took the gold from their hands and fashioned it with an engraving tool and made it into a cast metal calf. And they said, this is your God, Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of it. And Aaron made a proclamation, said, tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh, the Lord, the divine holy name of God given to Moses in Exodus chapter three. That is what they called this golden calf. And I think so many people do that with the word love and they say we're making love, but really they're making adultery. They're making fornication. The things that they're making are pulling them down to hell. And it's things like this and actions that would take place over and over again that would lead God in Jeremiah chapter three to talk about the faithlessness of Israel in which he said, I give them a certificate of divorce. But then a promise that would come in Jeremiah 31 That promise that would come in Jeremiah 31 is also quoted in Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 10 to say that the new covenant that we have now with God is not one simply written on stone, but now written on hearts. And the fact is, is that when it comes to us as believers, Jesus said in John chapter 4 to the woman at the well when she came to him wondering, where are we supposed to worship? He said, a time is coming and now is where the people of God will worship in spirit and truth. I don't need to go to Jerusalem to worship. Right? I don't need to go to the northern part of Israel to worship, but guess what? Right here, I'm in the United States, in California, at a church in Simi Valley, and I'm worshiping God today. And I'm going to do it every single day in my life because I am under the new covenant of God written on our hearts, not on stone. And we can now, as brothers and sisters in Christ, be faithful to the God who hates divorce because we, as brothers and sisters in Christ, if you are somebody who is married Your marriage needs to be a picture of your relationship with God. One relationship together, the two become one and are cleaved together until we come to be the bride of our bridegroom, the one that Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, he has betrothed us to that one Christ. Come together and be the bride that makes itself ready in the book of Revelation. This has been Chad Davidson, and this is the 511 News.